So this is class three, is that right? Great, I think we're actually making pretty good pro progress on the site, so that's good. It'll help us get to a point, I know. <laughs> this is sometimes an even slower process, if you can imagine. Um, but uh, you know, the quicker we get through the actual layout of things, the more time we'll get to spend on things like setting up sheets and setting up sections and details and things like that. So I think that's gonna be really um, helpful and eye-opening to a lot of you as well. So I do want to kind of get through this as, as quickly as we can. Um, so we, I'll just quickly discuss uh, week one. We spent a lot of time sort of setting up, ooh, pardon me, the, um, this file. We did all of the settings for, the, um, for Vectorworks itself, so all of the options, if you will, um, and made sure that all of our computers here, and then hopefully you repeated those steps at home, had the same settings so that when the book talks about doing something and is assuming that you know the join wall feature is activated that it will act the same way whether you're on your computer here or your computer uh, at home um, so those are important steps to go through if you haven't already set that up at home um, yeah so if I haven't set it up at home if I pull this file to home it will be set right? uh, no so okay, in good. the book though exercises um, the first few exercises, so there's an email that went out after class yeah, one. Um, so but it's a quick, it's a fairly straightforward uh, step through process. Uh, after we did that, so um, those settings were the vector work settings, so those will live on that computer so they will not change from file to file to file. Unlike, just as a reference, our document settings, which is where we set up things like the size of our sheets, um, whether or not there's a grid, uh, the scale that we want it to print out to, um, st stuff like that lives file to file. So it only lives in the file. If you have one file set up one way, you close it down and open up another file set up a different way, you'll see that there are, there are differences. Um, let's see here. So the book that we're using kind of steps us through uh, the quick layout of our building. That was kind of the first thing we drew was the house. We used the wall tool. So we are digging into these tool sets a little deeper than we did uh, last quarter. Um, the wall tool that we've been using is, well, it's in a couple spots, but we've been using the one under the um, building, let me see, what's it called? Yellow house. Yeah, and the name pops up. Um, the little building button, let's just call it that. And then up at the top of the list, uh, at least for mine, is the wall tool. So the nice thing about the wall tool, instead of simply doing a double polyline or something like that to represent a wall in plan, is that when you um, click on the wall tool and you actually go up to the preferences you'll find that you can set a thickness for the line in 2D um, and you can also set a height for that for the wall um, so when you're drawing in 2D you see a double line representing the wall but in 3D at the same time it's actually creating a three-dimensional wall um, so we were able to do a quick layout in plan, and then jump into 3D and actually see our walls. Can I ask one quick question? About yeah. That? So when you do that, when you're creating a new wall, and you make those definitions that you just have on that menu, that just does it for the wall yeah. that you're drawing right then. Is that correct? That's it's not like a, that doesn't become the default for the wall. Those settings will will stick. So if I were to draw that house. Um, if I draw the house walls, they would be of this height and this thickness. And if I went off and did other things and then clicked on the wall tool again and started drawing site walls, they too would be 16 foot tall and 8 inches oh, thick. Oh, so and all each that. time you want to do So you want to go in and make sure that the settings are what you want, essentially. But, but, how, but because your walls are not necessarily, like for example, I'm doing a site that has some walls that are one foot thick and some mm -hmm. walls that are 8 inches thick. Mm -hmm. So, so your process is simply, you know, going to the wall tool, hitting the preferences button, and then setting it up for the wall you're so, about to draw. Okay, so you just do it for each wall. Right. So the efficiency is, is if you know, I'm going to draw this type of wall, all of those, and then I have another type of wall, I'm going to draw all of those. So you're not kind of going back and forth. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Will we be able to connect two different height walls together, for instance, and I think someone mentioned it before, if you have a split level facade of a mm -hmm. house. Yeah, totally. So. You can, you'll see that although, um, you know, the house is drawn with, there's however many sides, six or eight sides to this house, 
but you can go in and you can select each wall independently. So I'm in 3D now, but if I click on this side, that wall is selected and I have in the object info palette just one wall. If I clicked on this wall, it would select that side. Um, and then, you know, once you've selected an object, like so many other times, you can actually manipulate it in the object info if you want. So I could come in here and, let's see if this works. Uh, <laughs> I could type in a new height for that wall. So if I wanted it to be 10 feet, yeah. <laughs> See, it'll just come right down. So the roof will somehow adjust. At that point, <laughs> well, now that's, that's a whole other monster right there. <laughs> um, what you're gonna find is that you have to get creative about how you apply the roof tool. So uh, we, and I, I guess I'll jump to that now. So the roof that we created here, or Vectorworks really created for us, was another tool um, where we simply selected the walls uh, for the structure that we wanted a roof to be uh, constructed for. And then Vectorworks kind of figured it all out for us and drew the roof. Uh, if it was a more complex roof, like you had a lower area and a taller area, then you would probably just define you know, that smaller area as a roof, and they'd select one, or create one there, and then you'd select another area for the, a second roof or a third roof. They may connect to the roof, so the, It won't be pretty, yeah. probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, it gets really complicated as the, as the roofs get more complex. Yeah. But um, but usually there's you know you get creative with that tool and you can start making things at least look pretty close. And well, again, the case is you don't put a roof on, right? I mean, it's, right. it's gonna. So that's really the overarching like theme of this is like it's just the building. We're landscape designers. We don't <laughs> care too much about the building. You can put a white box there and have that represent the house just as well, and really focus on getting the uh, the landscape um, up to speed. But you know, there's an argument here to be made that with things like the wall tool and the roof tool and the windows and the doors that we used, um, those two tools, that you can actually create a pretty convincing house relatively quick after you get, you know, some practice under your belt. Um, so, the... Oh, one, one more question. Yeah. On the wall, mm -hmm. um, the one I'm working on now, the client has an existing wall that's sort of this sinuous thing. Is there oh, a way you can... Sinuous. Um, e yeah, round wall. Yes and no. It's, it's but not round. We'll it's like an irregular thing. Yeah, an irregular thing. Well, it's a curve basically, but it's not like a perfect. It does. It's not composed of perfect arcs. Right. You know? <laughs> um, again, that might be one where you have to get creative with either maybe using the wall tool to do segments uh -huh. that you know straight line segments that kind of create a smooth appearance at least. Um, I'd have to look into that though okay. for like, because there's a, a, a round wall tool, right? I but it's that, very that circular, but you'd have to do it again in segments regular. and kind mm -hmm. of just have really wide um, radiuses for those walls to mm -hmm. kind of get it more softer. Mm -hmm. oh boy, yes, Adele first thing about how. Okay, the split level, I really should attack it. Oh boy. Um, should I build it as the total height of the wall by the section that I see the okay there's like a short piece over here yeah a two story we may have to just talk about that oh. together yeah because that might get into the weeds it. a little yeah I'm like should I build it level yeah. by level or yeah. should I build it by section let's talk about that offline because that's so is there a, a given um, average height for a floor level is it 10 by 10 to um, 10 to 10 or? you know there's small variations between house to house but like if you don't know, you might make some assumptions and say like 10 to 12 feet between floors. Um, we'll probably get you in the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we built the, the walls with the wall tool. Um, we had Vectorworks essentially create the roof for us. Um, then we, uh, we also used the window tool, which is also in the um, little house button for building shell. Sorry, portion of tool sets. Um, there's a window and a door tool. So again, for both of these, and I'll just click on one of them, um, for the window, uh, if you go to the preferences button up in the uh, tool preferences bar, thinks about it for a second, and then you have, you'll see that you have all of these different options and detail that you can get into for, again, the roof, or for the, the doors or the windows. You can really get into the minutia here. Um, 
we set up a few items. We kind of made the rough outline of the window and made sure that it was like a fixed pane instead of a double hung and all of that. Um, again, through all the settings that are shown in the book. Um, and so we kind of made the, the form and the visual that we wanted to get, but we really didn't get into the weeds too much on that one. Um, again, though, I'll just visit the classes option over here on the left side of this window setting window to show that all of those little bits and pieces we could define a new class for. And uh, more and more you're going to find through this quarter that the classes are really important because that is where, again, we get our graphic attributes for each piece. Um, case in point, we do have obviously glazing, which just means glass, um, as a part of our windows and doors for that matter. Um, in this case, we did set a specific class for those elements for glazing clear, and that within that class has a setting so that the texture, the sort of the 3D texture is essentially the same thing as thinking of it as the fill or the color um, for the 3D <coughs> appearance, but usually it's photorealistic. Um, in this case, the glazing <coughs> class looks clear. Uh, there's already a, a, a class set up within this file, so if I go down to glazing, this is where I have the clear option, but there's also a class in here set up for blue. So I could either have it appear more clear, um, or I could have it appear more blue. Are these windows like trees where I can save them in the resource folder and like use a 2862? You can, you can essentially set it all up and then you can tell it to save that setting essentially. Because you know, we're going through all our different windows in the house and if you want to increase your efficiency mm -hmm. and you want to do all your 2862s first mm -hmm. and then you different weird windows. Yeah, and you always have an option of just doing one and then copying and pasting it. So, um, just real quick back to the classes part of this. So, uh, lifting the hood a little bit. If, um, if I wanted to have a glass that was pink for some reason, um, I could go into my navigations um, window, go to classes, out of here real quick. I could go back here to the navigation window, make sure I'm in the classes area, do a right click, go to new, and then I could create a new class that was glazing pink. And I would come through to my and then here when I'm setting up my graphic attributes, all I'd have to do is come down to this bottom half again is where all of our 3D graphic attributes live. And again, they go by the name of textures in um, Vectorworks. I could come in here and I could set up the color for, um, for that glazing by clicking on the texture menu. And you know, if there was a pink glass option in here, maybe I want it to be green. I could set that up and I could set that up for each of these items so that any glazing that I attached to this class would have that sort of green appearance rather than blue and rather than clear. Okay, so that will reinforce that again and again as we go through tonight and in the following weeks. Um, but classes really play a, a strong role, just like they did in 2D really, but um, they have that added role of, of again defining what the graphic appears like in the 3D environment here as well. Okay. Um, so after we kind of drew our house quickly and the, the, the roof and all of that, let me go back to 2D. Um, we started laying out uh, our perimeter for the property. So there were uh, a section in the book about doing using the triangle tool to triangulate those locations. Um, that's a little bit of review from last quarter, but it's uh, helpful to kind of step through that again. And with the triangulated, um, Dimensions, we're able to find the back or the rear two points or corners of the property. And then we had some offsets from the corner of the house as well. Once we had those construction lines, temporary construction lines set, then we just used the wall tool again to draw or to connect the points essentially um, from perimeter to perimeter point. And that wall, again, was the wall tool. And, but all we did here was, again, go to the preferences and we made it thinner than the walls of the house, and we set it a little shorter than the walls of the house, so that that wall has a very different appearance from the walls of the house. And for the textures, what do we define here? So the textures, again, are coming from the class. 
if I click on one of the walls and go to object info, I see that the class is survey boundary fence. And if I go to navigation, I go down to survey, survey boundary fence, and I go to right click and edit just to see what the graphic attribute should be. I see that they're set up again here as a wood board. So when I jump into 3D, that wall shouldn't look like brick, it shouldn't look like stucco, it should look like wood board. So I'm just going to zoom around here, go up and render it, and sure enough, it looks like wood boards. Wow. Looks like they built a deck. Mm -hmm. And again, it's on both sides, so inside and outside. Uh, and as we continue in the coming weeks, we'll find out ways of kind of fine tuning, like if we wanted that, that texture only to apply to the outside of that wall for some reason, we could turn the texture off essentially on one side or the other. Yes? Just a quick question about classes in general. Mm -hmm. When you get like 60 million of these things, is there a way to search like quickly get to the one that you want hmm. instead of having to page in? How can you just oh, type? Um, so one like I don't know this isn't really a search but like if you are in if you've selected one in here and you know that you want to go to trees as a class um, you can probably hit like the T mm -hmm. well but it only goes well I mean I so know they're alphabetical but yeah but it just it gets you know, it gets complicated the only reason is because this computer set up so that you know your tile, which I'm going to leave it because it looks nice, but it's a small window, so I have pages and pages. Yeah. Stuff, and I thought that would just be a quick way. One uh, just, uh, one way, and this file is actually set up for this, but you can. Um, yeah. You know, you can you control it with this this file structure that comes in, and the way that works is let me see if this. Yeah, you can do close uh, expand. I so, I can't think to find sense. so you have this hierarchy here, um, so you can actually, you know, collapse those folders. Right. So it starts to make some of this a little more efficient. Mm -hmm. And just so you guys know, the way that that is set up is if you have, you know, in this case it's furniture is the um, parent class or the folder if you want to think of it that way. You can name your class furniture, and then if you just put a hyphen and then the next name, the next classification essentially, um, that will place it under furniture. So if I wanted furniture um, benches, I would create a class that is furniture hyphen benches, and it would show up under furniture as a, its own benches class. Mm -hmm. And you can continue on as complicated as you want. So if you have furniture hyphen benches hyphen wood, mm -hmm. you could have a separate class just for the wood that's on the benches. That hyphen thing has to be exact. Like if you <laughs> do furniture space hyphen. Yeah, the space doesn't like spaces. Oh. And then if you do one of the out of space, yeah. then you have Not their separate classes. Yeah. So it's all Experiment. standardized the name of the game. Right. Well I found it, it you know, it's under boundary. I just found it out, but it was just I couldn't be it would have been easy Boom. Yes, that would be nice. But hopefully well. I say hopefully like your own classes of setup right. is a little more efficient than that, but it does get really complicated pretty quick. Um, but no, I don't know of a way of like well, doing a quick the, search. The only reason I ask that is because when you do get somebody else's stuff and all these yeah. other classes That's come in, if, you know, yours, you try to make sure they're alphabetical so you can find them. I mean, obviously they're alphabetical, but it, it sometimes gets much more yeah. than you no, thought it would that's be. true. So, anyway. All right. Um, let's see. What else should I cover real quick? We talked a little bit about the existing trees briefly last week. Again, that's in the book. Um, I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but we learned that there is that existing trees um, tool that allows you to, again, select a symbol and uh, attach plant information to existing trees so that you can go in and you can go further, uh, define it as, you know, if it's in poor, good, whatever condition if you're thinking you're going to save it or if it needs maintenance or attention, um, as well as it'll help you to define at least roughly where the critical root zones will be for that tree and all that good stuff. Okay. 
Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Any other things I should cover before we start laying out the design? For those trees and shrubs in this one, are they standard issue? You just pick yeah. Out and to do those, those are, yeah, that's right. So those popped up um, as you open this new file. Um, so just real quick, let me see if I can get into the settings here. Um, well, we'll actually, we'll spend some time when we create our own tree symbols when we do our planting plan. But you'll see that um, just like we selected a tree symbol in 2D when we set up our plants uh, last quarter, you'll see that you can also select what type of 3D wrap or texture goes um, or is applied to that tree as well. So you can kind of define what it looks like in three dimensions as well as in 2D. All right. Okay, so um, does everybody have existing trees completed open? Mm -hmm. um, so this may vary a little bit from what we had uh, last week when we were finishing up our sort of survey layout with the house and the, the perimeter fence. Um, it has a couple extra existing trees here as well. Um, it has that weird kind of <coughs> existing tree that we all applied last week, um, the weird form. Um, and it has some of these uh, construction lines, you know, the triangulation lines, which just as a reminder are on their own class. So let me go to So in the navigation, or oh, actually I should just click here. Um, with that triangulation line selected, I see that in the class we have a class specifically for survey triangulation lines. If I go down to survey and look at the other ones, there was also tape lines, which we did some tape lines off the side of the house. Um, so mm -hmm. as we can go forward, we'll be able to turn all that stuff off, all that clutter off, but we won't necessarily delete it. Um, some people like to just delete it, and some people like to just turn it off. So you get to make that call. For this product, uh, for this process, we're going to keep them and simply turn them off in the class. All right, let me get to the book. Make sure we are following along. So um, tonight's exercises, uh, at least in the PDF version, they start out on uh, page 99, um, and it's called Setting Out a Design. Um, as I alluded to, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to focus on the back area and start laying out things like our proposed path, our proposed pa uh, landing, our proposed deck off of the house, um, and a few other things. By the end of the night, we'll have this whole area, at least in a very um, simple way, sort of blocked out for the future design. And by doing all of this work now, um, we'll find that creating and making those things like landscape areas and hardscape areas will be fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, as we move forward. Let me just do this real quick.